Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and thanks for joining us for this episode of New Books in Philosophy, which is part of the New Books Network. I'm Robert Talese. I'm professor of philosophy at Vanderbilt University. I co-host the program with Carrie Figder, Malcolm Keating, and Sarah Tyson. My guest today is Kevin Elliott. Kevin is lecturer in ethics, politics, and economics at Yale University. He specializes in political theory with an emphasis on democracy and citizenship. His new book has just been published with the University of Chicago Press. It's titled Democracy for Busy People. John Dewey and Jane Addams are both credited with the claim that the cure for democracy's ills is always more democracy. This sentiment is popular to this day among democratic theorists and democratic practitioners. The thought is that there's a democratic deficit that lies at the root of any political or social problem that a democracy might confront. Accordingly, a good deal of work in democratic theory aims to design new practices and institutions that can erase the deficit. But this strategy raises a problem. The civic task of democratic citizenship needs to be manageable for ordinary citizens. And ordinary citizens are differentially busy with other pursuits, many of which are independently valuable to them and even socially beneficial. Thus, the proposal for more democracy can be exclusionary. Now, in the book, Democracy for Busy People, Kevin addresses this difficulty head on. He devises a conception of the civic responsibilities of citizenship that's authentically democratic, but not overly demanding. Now, as usual, there's a lot to talk about. So let's begin, as we normally do, with the author. Hi, Kevin. How are you? I'm very well, Bob. How are you? Or thank you for having me. (laughs) It's all good. Yeah, I'm doing well. Um, So um, we usually start uh, with uh, the author um, himself. Um, Can you tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, Sure, yeah. Um, So I am a California native, uh, grew up in uh, the South Bay of San Francisco Bay Area, uh, in the heart of Silicon Valley. What is what has become Silicon Valley since since I uh, have left there? Really, um, uh, you know, went to public school, public high school, all that kind of stuff down there, um, uh, and then uh, went to college at UCLA. Um, and then, uh, you know, neither of my parents went to college, uh, so when I got there, I kind of didn't know what I was supposed to do. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people will, will sometimes have this experience. And so for me, I, I, I had the very fortunate um, uh, experience of taking a class on the history of social thought, uh, which really kind of ha- gave me that that liberal arts experience of, of being sort of awakened to uh, a sort of a critical awareness of the world and and a little bit of having kind of the, uh, the curtain pulled back and, and seeing kind of gears that are, um, uh, you know, making the world turn. And I was very, I was smitten, you know, with this. Uh, so during my time at UCLA, I began to think about um, the possibility of, of becoming an academic. I uh, just, you know, was just endlessly curious and always learning new things and, and just, you know, um, was was very, very enthralled by all of that. Uh, but I got some very frank advice uh, from a, from a, 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 a faculty member there that just that was basically like look being an academic is is, is really tough uh, you won't be able to pick where you live your chance of getting any job at all is very bad and this was in 2006 and things are very different now uh, right um, so uh, uh, in any case um, so I, I basically you know left uh, uh, the degree there and then tried to do something other than um, academia and wasn't really fulfilled. I was actually trying to like read academic books in my spare time. I had ideas. I had things I wanted to write. But um, it basically, after a couple of years, it became clear, yeah, I'm going to be trying to do academic kind of uh, inquiry on my own anyway. I might as well, you know, try to do it as 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 my job. So, so that's when I went to grad school. Um, I first did a degree at LSE and then one year master's at LSE and then uh, I went to Columbia for my PhD. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, at Columbia, you know, I had a wonderful experience uh, there. And in particular, um, especially under the influence of Melissa Schwartzberg, who, who later went to NYU, um, came to understand the importance uh, for democratic theory of understanding and having a 
awareness of empirical political science. So the way that I approach political theory and democratic theory uh, in particular is I try to be, uh, I try to combine insights from um, political science, economics, psychology, um, it, with uh, philosophy and political uh, theory um, uh, more, more broadly. Um, yeah, and so uh, uh, yeah, then I you know, got my got my PhD and um, uh, did a couple of years of teaching at Columbia before getting a, a, a tenure track job at Murray State University um, and uh, did a lot of teaching in, in uh, American government there uh, at Murray State uh, as well as in political theory uh, and uh, just with the publication of my book, um, you know, I have now moved to 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 Yale and be starting there in the fall. Wonderful. Um, that's that seems like quite a move. It's yes, it's uh, geographically think, all kinds of other respects. <laughs> absolutely, I, I, many other academics will tell a similar tale of right moving between places and moving between very different. Uh, it, Murray State University, for those of you who don't know, is in western Kentucky, a very small town, quite a rural region. Um, going from Columbia, which is in New York City, right? This is quite a change, um, but yeah, and now back to the Northeast. So, yeah, where you can finally enjoy pizza again. Ah, uh, yes, we are looking forward to the New Haven <laughs> style pizza. We are informed by everyone that uh, we're we have to try. Well, it. that's wonderful. Uh, so, um, let's talk about the book. Um, and I want to begin with some background now. Um, you know, academic books sometimes have characters that recur in them. Um, and a recurring character in your book is your mother. Um, now, and, and this was um, intriguing to me and uh, in some ways refreshing because, I, you know, I, I tend to think that um, moral and political philosophers and theorists more generally um, don't think enough about their their mothers. <laughs> when they're doing their academic work, I mean. Um, so uh, I remember being at a conference shortly after Trump was elected in which, you know, uh, a philosopher was going on about, um, you know, fascist Republicans. Uh, my mother is a Republican, by the way. Um, and I said to this person afterwards, I said, you know, am I, on the basis of your talk, am I supposed to think my mom's a fascist? And the person said, your mom's a Republican? I said, yeah. And the person said, well, I feel sorry for you. I said, yeah, that's, and I just thought like, that's a ridiculous response. Uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. so can, can, can you tell us a little book about um, the role that she played in sure. um, motivating some of the ideas that you're exploring here? Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I, I generally speaking, um, you know, the, the, you know, my mother, like I said, neither of my parents went to college. So my mother um, uh, did not go to college and she um uh, was a single working mother. Um, you know, parents divorced. I was raised by my mother, um, and uh, she didn't have a college degree. And so, you know, she had a lot of things on her plate. She had a lot of things uh, to do: taking care of me, going to work, taking care of the household, uh, and also trying to, you know, hold on to her sanity. Right? These, these, these. These things are, you know, you can get three of those four things at any given time. You know, it's uh, pretty, pretty tough, right? Um, and uh, so the, the, you know, the title, the, the eponymous uh, busy people is, are, are people like my mother. So for me, I, you know, I think sometimes, uh, especially many of the listeners of this podcast will probably think of busy people as, you know, maybe like, you know, jet setters, people with calendars full of high, high, um, uh, 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 stakes meetings and things like that, but but I'm really thinking about people like my mother. I think of busyness as a as a uh, uh, incomplete, uh, but nonetheless generally common currency of disadvantage. I think a lot of uh, especially uh, things like poverty, but also um, forms of, of of racial and, and and sexual oppression get get cashed out in terms of busyness. Uh, people have to think about and and occupy themselves with uh, activities that people who are not uh, don't fall into these categories don't have to uh, don't have to um, uh, 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 tackle or, or, or sort of deal with uh, you know a woman who is who's uh, subjected to sexist uh, disrespect at work for instance has to kind of process that and that makes uh, her busy right that can that can make her unavailable for, for other kinds of activities um, and and sort of we can go through other things right people have to work hourly jobs literally have to spend more time working in order to to, to make that right so anyway so 
so for me, for me, busy people are are, are the are, are are the sort of vast group of of, of people in society who whose um, obligations uh, in life compete with, as you were as you were saying, I think in your in your introduction, uh, it competes with their ability to right participate in politics in all the ways that we might wish uh, or all the ways we might expect good democratic citizens conventionally understood um, to involve themselves. Um, and, and this gives rise to what I call the problem of unequal busyness, um, right? So it's not just the case that all of us are busy. Some of us are busier than others. And because um, democratic participation competes with all of these other obligations that we have in life, um, the output the outcome, I suppose, for democracy, it creates a problem for democracy, and that is inequality, right? So the busy people are not able to uh, get their voices heard, their interests go um, uh, neglected. They might even be subject to various forms of exploitation and oppression and and, um, and other forms of, of not just neglect, but right positive harm, um, because they are not able to, they make choices that are incompatible with um, spending a lot of time thinking about politics and involving themselves in politics. So for me, um, you know, so what is the significance of my mother to this project, right? Um, lots of people before me have have looked at um, societies and seen that there are people who really do not spend a lot of time thinking about politics um, or, or concerned about politics. And some people will say, well, you know what we need to do is we need to like build build a fence around politics to try to keep these people out because they're, they're, they're just really not cut out for this, this politics thing. Um, and people like me are. Uh, and I just have an existential essentially commitment to saying, for lack of a better term, existential commitment to being like, well, no, actually, what we, we, that's not good enough. We, we need to do better. Can, uh, and so the, the book uh, is, is sort of premised on this question of how can democracy do better for people like my mother? Um, and, and I'm trying to think through then the, the two big questions about basically um, how can we I think we need to do two things. One thing is to rethink our expectations of what it means to be a good democratic citizen. So the first part of the book is about that. And then the second half of the book is how can we reshape um, or reform our institutions, our democratic institutions, to be more um, solicitous of um, busy people. Right. Right. Good. And I take it that also sort of what goes into your concept, or I'm sorry, your conception of busyness um, as it relates to the, um, you know, non-participation, <laughs> let's call it broadly, um, has to do with, you know, making a distinction that seems to me to be well worth making and not made often enough between those non-participants, you know, democratic non-participants who choose democratic non-participation um, and those who um, are non-participants in some, you know, by, by some other route, whether it be um, uh, lacking access to participation or whether it be um, uh, the case that uh, the open avenues that they have access to for participation come with opportunity costs that are more than they wish to bear. Is that right? Yeah. So, so there's, uh, one of the preoccupations is of the book is well, what would it mean for someone to make a meaningful choice to ignore politics, right? Um, and I think a lot of the time we kind of say, well, look, if you can turn out to vote, or you can come to this, you know, meeting that's in the evening and ha make your voice heard, right? And it's like, well, if I have small children, I, I kind of don't have, you know, the option to, to go to a, a meeting in the evening, right? Like that's actually not an open option. And of course, many people have made this kind of observation. And so one of the things that I, that one of the preoccupations of the book is like, well, what would it take? One of the questions that I'm trying to get at, especially in the first part of the book is like, well, what, what kind of conditions and what kind of ideas do we need in order to say that someone has in fact made a choice not to participate in politics? Um, there's this phenomenon called non-decision making, right? From, from political science uh, back in the back in the 60s and 70s with this idea that like well you know there many people don't make a decision and that um, can be mistakenly attributed as if they've made a decision right so you can say well you've chosen not to participate in politics and it's like oh I I actually didn't know that that was actually a thing that was open to me in realistically speaking right um, so again like s someone like my mother for most of her life she was not a good democratic citizen she did not pay attention to politics 
um, and just really didn't see politics as something that was like about her, that, that, that was something that was like open to someone like her. Um, and that eventually changed later in her life, but it was, uh, you know, the, it's, it's not like she made a decision. She just didn't think it was for her. Um, and if you, if you, um, impute agency to that choice, well, then you're just going to cut, you're going to, you're going to, uh, mistakenly attribute, um, right, uh, uh, su- supposedly political apathy or, or, or um, lack of interest in politics is something that people choose. So what I want to do is... Con- or, be, or contentment, right? I mean, that was... Yes, right. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. One of the thing, one of the dark, one of the dark m- moments of political science was that error, right? Yes, yes <laughs> Non-participation exactly. just shows how wonderful things are. Yes, people are satisfied. <laughs> if they were satisfied, they would come to these, they would vote, they would right, do all these things. It's like, oh, right, well, right. Well, Eventually, we figured out that, well, it's a bit more complicated than that. The reasons people do or do not participate. Yeah, exactly. That's great. That's great. So, um, the, the and just to pick up on on the sort of, um, you know, what's already underlying uh, the, the what you've already said. So, you see um, democratic citizen as a, citizenship as a moral office, right? It's the, it's the kind of role social role that we occupy in democratic societies where, um, you know, our conduct in that role can be assessed in, you know, some evaluative terms, right? Uh, Responsible, irresponsible, admirable, good, maybe even in certain kinds of extreme contexts, we can talk about a democratic citizen's behavior is wrong. Um, uh, Now, the first argument of the book um, has to do with making a case against at least most forms, most common forms of political apathy. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about how that argument runs and and, and what's driving it? Because there's a lot of defenses of apathy afoot around uh, these days. Indeed, yes, uh, absolutely. So, so just to clarify terms a little bit here, when 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 we speak of apathy, what I what I mean is is not like somebody who doesn't necessarily care about politics. It does include uh, the, 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 those people, but it's people who are like not paying attention to politics, right? So apathy in the sense of like ignoring politics, not not giving it any space in your in your in your attention in your bandwidth, right? That that's just that's what I, that's what I mean there. Um, yeah. So so uh, what does it mean for citizenship to be an office? Um, so so the the idea. Of of citizenship as an office contrasts with how we often think about citizenship as a status, right? So citizenship as a status, meaning that we are entitled to certain kinds of treatment, certain kinds of legal rights, maybe some, some certain kinds of treatment and, and entitlements and, and obligations uh, that, that might attach to uh, that, that status. Thinking of it as an office is, um, uh, is attached to, as you, as you mentioned, right, uh, Occupying the social role, and I think of it as uh, as a functional role in a wider institutional um, picture. So, so uh, uh, characteristically, like what 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 it means for a system of collective decision making to be democratic, um, on my account, is that it it requires. Uh, the input of citizens for making some kinds of very consequential decisions authoritatively. Like that's what democratic institution, a, a democratic system is. And that implies that democratic citizens as electors or people who attend the assembly or whatever, whatever, whatever specific arrangement of democratic institutions that you have in a particular democracy, um, citizens are playing a vital functional role. So for instance, if you held an election and elections were very important um, and nobody showed up, right? Uh, the democracy would fail, like the institutions would fail to do the thing that they're supposed to do, selecting leaders or whatever. Um, and so dem- dem- uh, democratic citizenship as an office is like based on this idea that, look, there are some things that citizens have to do for democracy to persist and for it to flourish, perhaps, for it to be justified, for it to be good, whatever whatever you want to say, like whatever, however you want to put that. So then the question is, okay, well then what do we need from citizens? Um, and so the first, as you say, the first chapter, the first argument is like, well, let's see how far can we ratchet this down, right? What What's the minimum of what we can expect from citizens? Because a lot of people think it's fine uh, if people ignore politics, right? A lot of people, it's just not a problem, right? Um, um, and in fact, it, that's sort of like built into the default of many, of many, perhaps most liberal democracies is like the default is that you're just going to do your private life and, you know, politics. If you want to do that, you can, right? There's nothing 
prodding you towards paying attention to politics, except maybe a very diffuse kind of sense of civic duty or something that's quite diffuse indeed, right? Uh, and and differentially diffuse, right? So <laughs> there, there are going to be all sorts of social corners and social milieu where there's no expectation whatsoever. So um, yes, um, so uh, apathy, uh, so so what's the problem with apathy? So is that okay? So uh, I advanced four arguments. I'd be a little tedious to run through them all, so I'm not, I'm not going to go through them, uh, but I will name them. Um, so, so, so I argue that, uh, you know, drawing on the work of many other uh, people working in democratic theory, um, that there is um, uh, people need to, or I should say cannot, uh, democratic citizens cannot ignore politics because otherwise um, that might make them complicit in injustice um, following the, the work of people like Eric Bierbaum and Tommy Shelby. Um, they need to uh, pay attention in order to avoid uh, contributing to harm um, and, and indeed harming other people um, through contributing to democratic inequality, uh, which would harm groups to which people belong. Um, they also uh, have to, and that, that kind of goes into the, the inequality argument. So um, if people are uh, ignoring politics uh, and they, they are contributing to inequality uh, among people that in their social groups, right, more, more broadly, and then that can lead to harm. So those are two distinct arguments, one about causing inequality and the other uh, causing harm. And then the last one is that uh, when people ignore politics um, uh, as, as a group, they become potentially a threat to uh, democratic regime's stability because uh, they become unsocialized to the, uh, to the to democracy, essentially, uh, and that enables them to be mobilized uh, by demagogues, by fascist or other forms of totalitarian movements, or communist movements, perhaps, um, and and that makes them potentially an existential threat to, to democracy as such. Um, so, so those are like the the big arguments um, in in that in that chapter. Um, you know, stated very, very briefly. Um, and in the end, I conclude that, you know, because of these, all of these different arguments, um, they're really, it really is incompatible with the office of, of being a democratic citizen to ignore politics, unless there are some very special circumstances where uh, uh, someone could uh, do that. Uh, one of them is is if it's temporary. Uh, so here there's this wonderful book um, that I think has, has been a little bit uh, neglected, or at least parts of it are really good, um, um, called In the Shadow of Unfairness by Jeffrey Green, um, where he uh, argues for a kind of Epicurean um, um, uh, uh, stepping out of the political realm into your garden to kind of recharge your civic batteries, uh, which is, I think is a very, very neat idea. Um, and, and so if, if you're ignoring politics temporarily, that's sort of fine, right? So that, because then you're going to go back and it's, you know, you're, you're, you're resting out of politics in order to get back into it. That's sort of fine. And the other conditions are like, you need to be able, you need to be paying attention to politics in order to make sure that you know, something very bad isn't happening. Um, and one other condition, there's a few other ones, but one other one is like, if you look at politics and see that people like you, people that belong to groups, like the groups to which you belong, um, if they are overrepresented, basically, if people are hearing enough from people like you, yeah, you know, like maybe it's okay for you to take a step back, right? You're not you're not going to be contributing to these harms of inequality and 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 so on um, in 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 problematic ways by 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 stepping away from politics. So, yeah, those are interesting, and you know, you raise this in the book. I mean, especially with respect to um, uh, certain um, current defenses of ignoring politics, which seem to have a weird conceptual problem, which is that. Um, uh, the defense is uh, the defense of ignoring politics is that it's perfectly a, a fine thing for you to do with your agency to pay no attention to this thing. But as you point out, <laughs> right, it's like, well, you have to look at it to decide whether <laughs> you know there is a kind of paying attention to something. Um, uh, you know, ignoring something is a is is a kind of exercise of your attentional capacity towards it. At least at some point, is that yes. right? Yes, it's a choice. <laughs> right, exactly. So if you want to. 
pretend, and let's let's just pretend for the moment together, we can pre- pretend together that people are making a choice to ignore politics. That's not usually how it goes, but sometimes. Um, well, if people are making that choice, then they have to be making that choice with some amount of information, right? Um, and so there's this uh, uh, there's this one argument that's fl- that floats around um, that that runs something like. Um, well, look, you can do more good for society by uh, doing work in the market and then using the income that you get from that to like, um, you know, alleviate suffering through effective altruism or other forms of, of, of um, pro-social uh, giving. And the thing about that is that that presupposes that you know that that is the best use of your time and that making that decision requires you to pay attention to politics and to calculate right all of these things in a in a much more uh, politically informed way where if you are ignoring politics you can't as you said you cannot make that decision in an informed way and that's my that's my point is that you have there is no way of getting underneath at least paying attention to politics no one can be a good democratic citizen and ignore politics because you cannot know whether um ignoring it is whether you're ignoring the rise of a of a dictator or whatever right <laughs> that's right. Right, right right very good so the so by the end of that chapter the first chapter then we've established that there are some requirements of a normative sense for democratic citizenship for you know responsible behavior within the office the social role of the citizen um but then you're concerned about um conceptions of uh, those role responsibilities that are overly demanding. Um, and so the next move in the argument is to say, well, you know, democratic citizens are under a normative requirement to behave in certain ways. They can't just ignore politics. But um, they, th- there's a limit to what can be built into those civic requirements. And here, your argument is driven by what you call the paradox of empowerment. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Th- those arguments? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So, so the, the, the first chapter, you can think of it usefully as like trying to establish that there's a floor of democratic citizens somewhere, and it's got to at least be paying attention. And, and maybe there's a little bit more to it than that. Um, uh, and then this chapter is about, well, okay, is there a corresponding ceiling? Is there like a way that democracy can expect too much from us? Can it be um, uh, too demanding? And of course, verbally, we can all agree, well, yeah, sure. Like it can be too demanding. I mean, that's just in the, in the nature, like in, in, Anyway, but what would that what would that mean? What would it mean for for uh, uh, citizenship to be um, overly demanding? And so here it's it's quite interesting because there there it has uh, there is a long uh, standing uh, disagreement among um, not yeah long standing disagreement in democratic theory between people who think that uh, democratic theories um, are structurally require people to do things that they cannot do. Right. Um, and so here I'm thinking people like Joseph Schumpeter, uh, more recently, people like Jason Brennan, um, who, who make this argument that like, look, citizens are just kind of like not up to the task of being uh, good citizens. Any attractive conception of democracy um, is or if not any, that most right attractive conceptions of, of democracy are going to be too demanding for ordinary people. Um, and so then what we need to do is like ratchet down the expectations of, of citizens uh, because they're because they are incapable of making uh, of doing more, uh, doing more than that. That is notably and not and, sorry. And then there was there's a response. The, the response to that is that, well, Maybe that's the case under under contemporary society, under representative institutions, under capitalism, or something like that. And if we could just change those um, uh, uh, the sort of social milieu facts about the social milieu, well, then maybe citizens would be able to rise to the occasion, right? Um, and if we look at this this little you know community here, which has these participatory you know things, or we see, look at this deliberative experiment, well, actually, citizens are capable of rising to the occasion. And, you know, people on the other side, the skeptics, the cynics, they'll come back and say, well, look, I've got a hundred years of data, you know, that suggests it goes the other way, right? So it leads to this impasse. So in this in this chapter, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say, well, look, maybe let's, let's instead of um, looking directly, ironically, given what I said about empirical political science and stuff, well, um, if we're just like, 
uh, having an argument about, well, what can we infer from the empirical evidence? Well, are there some kind of principled arguments that we can make, more generally speaking, um, about what would what it would mean for democracy or a democratic theory to be too demanding? So, so I, I look initially. Uh, so I make sort of two big arguments in this in this chapter, um, where where first of all, I I, I think, well, you know, um, are citizens enti- Do citizens have an entitlement um, to um, to basically democracy not asking too much from them, right? So what, what would what, what would that what would it mean for citizens to um, um, have uh, an entitlement to their their time? What for what reason? I should say, um, what does how does politics compete with um, other demands in our in our lives? Um, and so here, you know. I just appeal to, I appeal to some of these um, arguments coming from sort of you know, the Rawlsian tradition and the sort of more broad broad uh, sort of liberal tradition that look we all have conceptions of the good life and these conceptions of the good life have different um, amounts of space in them for politics uh, and we are uh, we are and ought to be uh, entitled to uh, the time we need to 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 pursue those different conceptions of the good life um, and here I you know there's this wonderful book by um, uh, by uh, Julie Rose called free time, and I, I draw extensively from from that. And and R- Rose argues that that citizens uh, that I, pardon me. So she's she's her book is about distributive justice. So she's concerned about what do people deserve um, uh, in their lives, and she thinks that they re- they require free time in order to exactly as I was saying um, develop their pursue their conception of the good life. Um, and that's fine, uh, but she she does provide a there's a proviso, and she says, but there are there is a, a, a an amount of socially necessary labor that we all have to contribute to, um, and for her, she thinks of that mainly as care work and work in the market. I add that it also requires, if we live in a democracy, some amount of participation. Right, going back to that idea that democracy requires some amount of input from us um, as as part of the office of democratic citizen. And so, if we include um, uh, our, our sort of work as citizens with these other forms of socially necessary work, she she implies that, well, what we need to do is we want to make that package, those demands, as small as possible in order for people to have as, as much free time to pursue their conception of the good life as possible. So I argue that there's a, a, a an entitlement founded on justice um, that should um, create a default that if we can make democratic citizenship less demanding, that we we are we are sort of obligated to do that in order for citizens to be able to right, have more free time to 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 pursue other 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 things. Um, there's a bunch of really interesting objections I got to this uh, over the years. I, I pre- I've presented this chapter in a variety of forms, um, and so like one of them is is like people would would say, well, uh, I, people would would. I have this response a couple of times. People were just could not believe that there could be a conception of the good life that did not include politics. I, I just found this. I, I was like, oh, really? And again, coming back to my mother, and I was like, my mother didn't think about politics, and you know, her life wasn't, you know, terrible, whatever. Um, so uh, <laughs> you know, so that was that, that was interesting. And and my response would be to say, well, yeah, some people uh, are going to have politics as an integral part of the good life, but not everybody, right? That's just a, uh, it's inconsistent with pluralism, with the idea that we have with a kind of a liberal vision that, that we all have different conceptions of the good life. Um, so, so, so that's the first kind of principled argument. The, and the second one gets to uh, a long last, <laughs> you're, what you're talking about with the paradox of empowerment, right? So um, it, in your introduction, you, you mentioned that um, uh, Jane, people like Jane Adams and, and John Dewey view um, every democratic problem as as solvable with more democracy. Um, and the problem with that, again, as you as you as you were, were, were sort of um, uh, suggesting, is that well, sometimes our uh, democratic solutions, uh, when it comes to new institutions. Uh, the idea there is to open up new opportunities for citizens to participate, and then they will sort of take advantage of them, right? Uh, if only we throw open the doors uh, to uh, the halls of power, the people will flood in. Um, I call this the uh, the if you build it, they will come hypothesis, uh, right? Um, and uh, it, it seems to be my read of the empirical evidence, and I, I I don't think this is an unreasonable one. Is that it's it's basically false uh, that 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 hypothesis is basically just like not true. Um, 
uh, as an empirical matter, what tends to happen uh, is that when you open new ways to participate, and particularly when those new um, um, forums for participation require costly, difficult, or time-consuming forms of participation, what happens is that people who are traditionally advantaged in society they are the ones who are able to take advantage of those opportunities. Um, and so I, I, I chronicle in the book a bunch of empirical uh, instances of this happening. We see this happening in, in lots of different contexts. We see this happening in development contexts where uh, you'll have development projects will include uh, a, a, um, uh, uh, a forum for the people who are receiving development aid to have a say in its distribution or in its, um, in its administration in one way or another. And these forums will very often get dominated by, for instance, men, people of higher caste, older people uh, living in that community. Uh, and, it, and then, in other words, that this supposedly democratic, inclusive uh, forum ends up being dominated by the people who are already socially dominant. Um, and that's, that's the paradox of empowerment in opening new ways to participate, um, uh, it, to, to empower uh, a more inclusive polity, a more inclusive uh, group of group in society, we end up just putting more tools in the hands of traditionally advantaged people to basically continue their influence, perhaps even to deepen their influence over, um, over, over politics. Right. And that's especially problematic if the new venues and sites for democratic participation are also supposed to be um, or reflect sort of an enrichment of influence. Right? It's like if the new if the, if the new venues and sites are places where, you know, the people's voice can be even more authentically or clearly heard. Yeah. Or <laughs> then more, more, not more, only do you incentive. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was going to say more authoritatively heard. Right. Where these where yeah, these right. where these yeah. are empowered spaces. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And then it just looks like it not only incentivizes um, those who are already advantaged to, you know, rush in, um, but it makes whatever um, problems with respect to justice and equality and all the rest that already persist in society even more pronounced uh, because it gives those who are already advantaged by <laughs> by roughly the way things are and even more a, a new, uh, you know, Right, as you were saying, sort of a new a new lever to pull. Right? Exactly, exactly. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah. The, you know, the simplest example of this, it's very, very simple and straightforward. Is if you if you can if you conceive of campaign finance, that is to say, giving money to candidates or parties or whatever. If yeah, you that's a good example. Yeah, if you conceive of that as a way that citizens can have input into the democratic process, which is not how I see it, but certainly you know. I think the U.S. Supreme Court sees it that way, but if you see if you see that as a form of democratic participation, the paradox becomes apparent very quickly, right? It's like, well, here's a way for people to participate. Anybody can give money, and it's like, well, we all know who's going to, you know, who's going to do that. Only the people who have the specific resource at hand to engage in that form of participation. And so, it the the, the paradoxical nature of this is that if we close off that form of participation or that you know that that venue of participation the, the that would actually improve democracy that would actually improve democratic equality and that's what can make it paradoxical actually right closing down certain avenues of participation can improve democracy that seems counterintuitive that seems paradoxical but it makes sense when we when we think when we think this way that's right. Right. Great. So um, let's turn down then to the, to your own view, which has got a kind of um, uh, not exactly Goldilocks, but certainly a, a Aristotelian uh, um, dimension to it that you're trying to hit the right – uh, the right mean between um, our conception of the normative demands of democratic citizenship being not demanding enough and them being too demanding. Um, so you develop a conception that you call standby citizenship. Um, and standby citizenship um, rests on uh, an argument about um, the democratic priority, the priority for, for democracy of inclusion uh, over equality. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that argument runs? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, right, as you say, stand, so um, uh, since Standby citizenship. I mentioned before that I'm I'm looking for a kind of minimum of, of democratic citizenship, and standby citizenship is is the sort of fleshed out um, account. Uh, the idea is uh, composed of basically 
two main parts. Um, so what does it mean to be a standby citizen? It means that you periodically pay attention to politics, ideally in a sort of a critical way, and that you maintain the civic skills that are needed for you to participate actively as a citizen. Um, that This combination means that that standby citizens will, will surveil politics, will pay attention to politics and, and, and think about like what's going on in it. And then they'll be prepared to step in to participate actively um, should they, you know, see the need for doing so arise. Um, so uh, the idea there is standby citizenship is meant to be um, the most undemanding way possible to um, conceive of the office of democratic citizen that still enables democracy to function, right? So we, we want the office to, to contribute well to the functioning of democracy. Um, and so this does that, but it's also as inclusive as possible. It's as undemanding as possible while still being compatible with democratic functioning. Um, but that raises this question about, well, why should we privilege inclusion in our ideal of citizenship? Shouldn't we, you know, uh, what if we privilege, you know, activity, right, or or, or equality, maybe something like that? Um, surely there's something to be said for these other democratic values. So why should we put inclusion first among democratic values, especially over something like like equality, um, right? So someone might say this seems to be leveling down. What, shouldn't we try to level up or something like that? Um, well. Um, so, so, the, the, so I make this argument for the priority of inclusion, and the, the 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 argument kind of goes like this. And first of all, consider the difference between equality and inclusion, just to clarify. Um, inclusion is about who's admitted to politics, to the political realm, right? Who who's afforded a ticket into the political arena. But equality is about the division of power within politics among those people who are admitted into the political arena, among those who are included. Um, and so my, my contention is that if we have to choose between these two, and sometimes we do, um, we should put inclusion first because the harms that are involved in being excluded are categorically worse than um, those involved in inequality. Because when we're excluded, we count for nothing, right? We are we are a zero. Think about this as like a, a, a multiplication problem, right? If there's a million of us, but we are excluded, right? All of us is count for zero. So a million times zero is zero, right? Um, but if we are included on unequal terms, right? So if my vote is only worth one-tenth that of somebody else's, but there's a million of me, right? Well, then together, we don't count for a million. We count for what? A hundred thousand. And that's better than zero, right? Um, so uh, I use this example briefly, this brief example in the text of um, of uh, the the formerly enslaved uh, people during Reconstruction, right? So the Fifteenth Amendment gives them voting rights, um, but they're admit and so that that includes them in the political system, but the political system that they're given admittance to is like very unequal, right? Uh, the American political system in the 19th century has got corruption in it. It's got, uh, um, it's got classism. It's got all sorts of, 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 of corruption in it and, and, and so forth. But it was viewed by them and viewed by many other people since, right? As like, obviously a watershed moment for their place in society and indeed in their ability to use politics, use their political voice to improve their lives and their protection uh, by the law. Um, and it seems to me that that suggests that uh, inclusion has this categorical importance. If we are forced to choose, we should choose uh, inclusion over um, equality. Um, so uh, one other place that we can see this uh, is in, if we think about John Stuart Mill, uh, right, who is somebody who is um, committed to inclusion, but is willing to uh, allow for inequality, right? Um, that seems to be in a, a sort of a million um, democracy, uh, which is more somewhat elitist, but everyone is included. That seems to me to be a, a more attractive arrangement than, for instance, Athenian democracy, where only 10, 15% of the population had any political participation rights at all, uh, right? So um, it, depending on what your intuitions are, right, I, I'm, I'm suggesting that uh, we should strictly prefer Mill to Athens, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and, and I think that, yeah, so, so that's, that's how that argument goes. Uh, perfect. Um, so uh, we've got then a conception of standby citizenship and um, uh, as a um, 
conception of democracy, of democratic citizenship that's thick enough to support the idea that it's a moral office, uh, but also inclusive enough that it doesn't um, uh, exclude people who are busy. Um, so the second part of the book um, talks about the institutional stuff. Um, you know, what, what, what should democracy look like as a system of institutions, uh, given this conception of citizenship? Um, and, uh, you've got a chapter each, uh, on elections and on parties. Can you tell us about, uh, those, in th those sort of central institutions, uh, to democracy and how they, how they change or what they look like once we adopt the conception of standby citizenship? Uh, yes, absolutely. So, um, uh, elections tend to be a little bit, um, I think, neglected among democratic theorists. Uh, they're, 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 you know, democratic theorists are most enthusiastic about other kinds of institutions. I think that might be the, the uh, a, a fair way fair way to put it. Um, and I think that's unfortunate, right? Because um, elections have a, a, a set of unique features that make them extremely. Um, Good for uh, uh, busy people, uh, and and some of this is, very, is qu in some ways is quite obvious, right? So, um, electoral participation is at least potentially extremely cheap and easy for people to do, right? Um, we we know of lots of ways to make voting extremely easy. Uh, mail voting is literally the ballot comes to your house. You don't even need to leave your house to vote, right? With, with, with mail voting, um, th you, there might be other concerns about mail voting. But when it comes to this, it's very easy, right? Uh, we can also uh, make, uh, uh, you know, election day a holiday. We can have voting on the weekend. We can require people to vote. Um, although that's we can, I don't need. We don't need to get into mandatory voting. Um, but um, but there's lots of ways that electoral participation can be made extraordinarily accessible compared to virtually any other form of participation. Voting is just um, dead easy and and or, uh, is very inexpensive, very accessible to people. Um, yeah, especially since all of the infrastructure is built, right? <laughs> I mean, right? This is the uh, right, we don't. Right? Part of what makes it so easy is that it we already built it. <laughs> right. right, it's already it's there. here. It's already here. Yeah, yes, right. exactly. Yeah. Yes, um, and, right. and, and yes, that's right. And 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 there right voting didn't used to be quite so easy. Right, there there was there was a time when you physically had to go down. Uh, to, to, to be counted in, um, yeah, in like a very limited period of time. Anyway, uh, yes. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so, so elections have this feature. And then uh, the other thing is uh, that, that elections are also um, this, they're a big social event. They're a big coordinated social event, every, well, at least potentially, not always, but right. Um, ideally, uh, and, and in, in many cases, elections focus on, all of society's attention on this uh, on this event, on this competition between between the parties, between the candidates, and that is helpful in sort of like drawing busy people's attention to politics. Right? You might be concerned with your daily life, but you know when it's election time, when it's campaign time, um, you have ev you have the news is full of this stuff. People are talking about it. Maybe again, depending on the place that you live, maybe this is not so much the case in the U.S. Maybe there are big public events in your community, uh, marches or or festivals or something like that, which are, um, you know, a, a, a drawing your attention or a big, a big, like a speech or something. Um, it's like, oh yeah, like, like politics is happening right now. Like this is the political season, right? When we should be paying attention to politics. Um, uh, uh, Emily Chapman has this book that just came out last, uh, last fall called election day, which is, uh, emphasizes very much this like big, the, 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 Social happening of um, of elections uh, is is very important for um, understanding how, how it's this like mass inclusionary event um, that that can help sort of um, take people out of their uh, ordinary run of life uh, and and focus them on politics. So so elections have this have this wonderful feature of being accessible, cheap and easy. And then the last thing that they do uh, that is very important is that elections are authoritative. Right, they're not. They are not advisory. The, you know, well, uh, not when democracy is functioning well. Uh, right? right. You know, elections decide who occupies office, and uh, that, and and in and in at least in an electoral representative democracy, you know, uh, uh, offices are where we repose power. So uh, it's a very good thing that elections have this power because it's cheap and easy, accessible to everybody, and decides highly consequential issues authoritatively. Um, 
This is not the case for many other forms of um, participatory input. Uh, it is not the case that, for instance, like a public comment period, um, right, or a congressional hearing, which can get very fine grained information out of citizens. But it's just, you know, OK, we'll take that under advisement. Right? That stuff is not is not binding, is not authoritative. So elections have all of those features. Political parties, um, I think, are are are. Uh, there has been uh, a good deal of, of interest in political parties among democratic theorists in the last few years. And I think that's very, this work has been wonderful. I think this is some of the, the, the most uh, innovative, interesting work in, in democratic theory in, in many years, in, in some years, in some time. Yeah, and um, it's also been a shift, right? I mean, because yes. um, a lot of the current work on political parties is actually, you know, pretty, pretty pro parties. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Exactly. Whereas in the past it had been like political parties are these corruption generating machines, right? Yes. Yes. That's exactly right. Yes. So yeah, right. So, so this, this, this most recent, uh, um, generation of, of, uh, work on political parties has been largely laudatory. Um, and so, so what one note about that is, um, I think a lot of that work. And so I have this, uh, one of the things I emphasize is that, you know, parties can be really good, but people but that is contingent on parties facing competition and i think that um yeah and i i think that many a, a lot a great deal of the work that people have done uh, celebrating parties has not sufficiently appreciated that um there's been a lot of work that's like emphasizing parties are good because they do this this and this they they have these functions they they do these things for democracy and i would say you know ah not always, right? They 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 will they will do those things when they face competition. When they don't face competition, that's when you get the parties as, for instance, uh, sort of cartels. This that you, this is a common view of of political parties and political science that that political parties are are cartels that are seeking to capture the state so that they can take advantage of all of its goodies for it for their supporters alone. And um, I. And yeah, and so this cartel theory of political parties, I would argue, is something that can only really uh, uh, get off the ground and become as ugly as it as it can get when parties do not face competition, do not face effective competition. So, so that, that this is one of these 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 arguments um, uh, th that I that I emphasize. The other thing, um, distinctive thing that I that I, that I uh, emphasize about political parties and their importance for busy people in particular and for a democracy for busy people. In many ways, I think parties are perhaps the single most important institution um, for uh, 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 building a democracy for busy people because they, um, they have this function uh, that Paul Snyderman calls the ecological simplification uh, function. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, politics, as we all know, c can be very complicated. There's a lot of issues going on at any given time. There's a lot of, uh, of, of potentially, depending on the democracy you live in, many different groups, many different um, interest groups, many different parties that are competing with each other. And so uh, it can seem like it's a big cacophonous, complicated mess. Um, and so uh, what parties do is that they simplify uh, the vast array of issues that might be um, concerning people at any given time, and they make the stakes of an electoral choice clear, simple, and meaningful. And this scaffolds, I, I argue, this scaffolds the participation of citizens because instead of having to bring meaning themselves or bring information themselves to uh, uh, the electoral choice that they're faced, parties are making it for them. They are desperate <laughs> to reach people. So elections are easily accessible to people. It, it, think of it as like elections can bring political power to citizens' door, and then parties are practically trying to break down the door <laughs> because when they're facing participation, they want to bring persuasive messages to you to get your vote. And here, I'm not making, you know, I'm, I'm, I make no assumptions about parties as, as being ide idealistic. They are interested in power. But when they face competition, that power can be pressed into the service of building a more inclusive democracy of reaching citizens who are might otherwise not be paying attention to politics. Um, empirical political scientists will tell you, it, you will never win the vote of a highly engaged citizen because they've already made up their minds. The persuadable voters, the people you can get are the people who are marginally att uh, attached to politics. And then the challenge is how to mobilize them. And anyway, so political parties do that work when they have to face 
um, competition. Uh, there's some wonderful history I talk about uh, with respect to like parties, political machines in the United States, which are these very corrupt, you know, they're, they're, the, they're the quintessential example of like corruption in, in American history, but they built enormous mass electorates. You think about Tammany Hall in New York, um, over the course of four or five years, they doubled the size of the electorate by, imp- by enfranchising uh, um, new immigrants. And then they enfranchised them and they 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 um, they 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 forged um, political uh, uh, inclusion for them by telling them vote for the party we are we we're we're going to take care of you essentially um, right 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 so, right great yeah well fantastic so Kevin you've been really generous with your time but I do want to make sure that we get to talk about um, uh, the 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 last full chapter of the book. Um, where you address um, some some pretty current trends. <laughs> well, the whole book is addressed to current trends, but um, you, this seems to be gathering. Uh, this trend seems to be gathering force, which is the 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 trend towards lotocracy or uh, non electoral uh, forms of democracy. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about the the engagement that you've had, both and both with um, uh, sortition. Um, these are the mini publics people uh, and um, the deliberative Democrats who uh, seem to be um, increasingly an overlap at this point. Yes, right. Um, yeah. So so I think this is I think I mentioned this earlier. This is where you find some of the, the, the biggest energy in democratic theories among people who are interested in uh, building new ways for for citizens to participate that involve generally in-person deliberation. So they're People are getting together. They're talking with each other about the issues, and they're maybe issuing um, reports. Maybe they're issuing recommendations to mass uh, electorates, um, or uh, or to or to governments, to 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 uh, elected officials. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and this is not just uh, among sort of academics. There's a whole uh, flourishing um, sort of uh, industry, really, uh, of of people who are, are who are. Helping facilitate these these types of these types of institutions, they've been institutionalized in in places like um, Ireland uh, uh, and uh, Belgium. Um, they have uh, used these numerous times to make um, big consequential decisions, basically. So so there's a lot of excitement about this stuff uh, in, in democratic. And some theory. of the vocabulary has even been trademarked. Oh, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. Deliberative, <laughs> deliberative polling. Right? Yes, has a little has the TM, has the tra- yeah. TM. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, so yeah, so it's it's a, it's a big it's a big important part of of uh, the the democratic reform movement. Um, and so uh, uh, what I sort of a, attempt to assess is well, what role could these play in a democracy for busy people? Um, and what kinds of uh, things can 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 these deliberative institutions do? So one of the things I do is I I, I look a, a very deeply at the empirical um, um, uh, studies of these of these institutions. There have been a lot of them, um, uh, and what I what I look at is um, what I find is that these institutions could do a, can do a lot for the people who are uh, on them, right? So for someone who goes and spends a weekend talking about a political issue, this really can have, seems to at least, the evidence that we have seems to suggest, and it makes sense that it would, seems to have lasting um, uh, uh, effects on transforming the sort of um, um, orientation towards politics and, and uh, the interest that people have in politics. Uh, and that's very good, right? Like that's the kind of thing that could help turn somebody, a citizen like my mother was into the kind of citizen that she is now, right? So now she's, she's an informed, engaged citizen. Um, and maybe, maybe deliberation could, could do that. Um, the issue, the sort of problem with that uh, is when we turn to um, the citizenry as a whole, um, there really aren't enough of these institutions as is usually thought of for them to actually make a difference for most people, right? So, um, you know, these institutions are generally involving a couple of hundred at most um, citizens who are randomly selected. Sorry, so I didn't mention, I didn't explain when you mentioned lotocracy and sortition, right? What these are, are random selection mechanisms for people who will then serve in these, on these deliberative panels. So usually, uh, as, as you mentioned, Bob, the, these things are considered together these days uh, by reformers. Um, we want citizens to deliberate, but we want to try to get a, a, a representative cross-section of them by selecting them randomly from, from the population. Um, now, uh, 
so, so, so what I've just said is citizens, uh, they, it, this seems to be able to, to uh, build inclusion, build standby citizenship um, among individuals, but not for the mass public because there's not enough of them. So then you, you might get the response, uh, well, let's just have more of them. <laughs> right? Well, if there's enough, scale them up, exactly. And this is where you begin talking about truly transforming representative democracy, right? Um, because on the one hand, if you, get, if you do a lot more of these, um, you, you face this choice. Do you make them authoritative or do you make them advisory? And this creates a dilemma. If you make them authoritative, Let's take advisory. If you make them advisory, then you raise this question about, well, why would I want to participate in something that can just be disregarded by the people who actually matter? Um, and that will have selection effects, right? So if it's an advisory thing, some people are, will not, even if they're randomly invited, will not attend unless they're required to. And as we know, like with jury duty, you still don't always get an especially you know, representative group. And to be clear, there has never been a randomly selected deliberative um, forum where people were required to serve. Like the, that, that, that is not a thing that exists other than the criminal, criminal or civil juries. Right? Jury duty has that function, but none of these other experimental ones have. So if you make them advisory, you're going to get selection effects that can affect how they, it, you're not going to reach the people that you're trying to reach if you make them advisory. The quality of the deliberation might, might be different because um, people aren't necessarily going to um, want to be there if you make them uh, necessary, if you make them mandatory to, to, to attend. So advisory ones have all sorts of problems. If you make them authoritative, then what you're talking about is really transferring power completely away from elections and away from political parties and towards deliberative mini publics. This is the vision that the most ambitious um, people thinking about these take, people like Alain Landemore, people like um, Alexander Guerrero. Um, and the, the issue there is with uh, the argument that I made a minute ago that parties are vital because they simplify the, the dizzying chaos of politics down to something that's understandable for ordinary people. If you um, removed parties from the, the the important central place that they have in electoral uh, institutions, what you will do is you will cause an explosion in, com in the complexity of politics facing citizens. And that is going to have vastly demobilizing, vastly exclusionary effects because busy citizens will be like, I don't know what I should vote for. I'm now being told by all of these different groups. Uh, yeah. So, 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 so that seems to make, make it very difficult to, um, for, for, for busy people to be able to make useful uh, use of these institutions. Um, just to, the, one, one last note, there, I think there are useful uh, applications of them. I'm not, I don't mean to foreclose this, right? This is a very, painting with a broad brush here. There are designs that I think can be helpful. Um, the, the kind of institution that they have uh, in Oregon, or at least had in Oregon, I, I think these have sort of fallen into quiescent, uh, into disuse uh, in the last couple of elections, but um, you, you would have some deliberative many publics would consider um, direct democracy initiatives that are placed directly on the ballot, referendums, um, and then would, would, would hear from experts, hear from people pro and con, and then would write an, a recommendation, which would then be sent to um, all voters in the voter pamphlet. Those types of institution, that, that type of application of these, I think is quite good for busy people because precisely it is providing them information that they can use um, in elections. So, so I don't mean to like, I'm not like totally dismissing these institutions. I don't mean to be doing that. I think they do have a place, but it's, it's a place that's quite, um, it, it's complementary to, it ought to be complementary or even sort of secondary to electoral institutions. That's, that's where I end up. Yeah. Yeah, it's more modest than what some of it, it, its use is more modest than what some of its more um, enthusiastic advocates suggest. Precisely, precisely. <laughs> Very good. Um, so, Kevin, I want to just you know thank you for joining me. It's been really just wonderful uh, to talk to you about your new book uh, for New Books in Philosophy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been a wonderful conversation.
Great. Um, uh, before we go, we'll thank the listeners. Thank you for uh, joining our discussion. Um, I've been talking to Kevin Elliott. Uh, Kevin has been um, uh, Kevin has just published rather uh, a book with University of Chicago Press that I really recommend. Uh, the book is titled "Democracy for Busy People." Thank you for listening to New Books in Philosophy, and bye for now.